Chapter 61 The Day of Atonement Leviticus 23, 26-32 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be day of atonement, it shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. And whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute for ever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, ye shall celebrate your Sabbath. Leviticus 23, 26-32 here again, as in Leviticus 16, we have laws concerning the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Three times in these seven verses there is the command, Ye shall afflict your souls. The Berkeley Version gives us, Humble yourself and humble your souls, and Robert Young's literal translation of the Holy Bible also uses the word humble. Goldberg called attention to the fact that Sorrow in itself does not take away sin. What God requires is not sorrow on our part, but rather a redirection of our lives that is grounded on the fact of atonement. The Hebrew word anah means to depress, and we are to recognize our pride and sin, and to trust not in ourselves, but in God. Since man's sin is to be his own God, Genesis 3.5, to afflict our souls is not merely a negative, introspective attitude, but rather a trust in the grace and power of God. To trust in God means to depress our trust in ourselves and our righteousness. In Leviticus 16, the priests were instructed concerning this day. Here it is the layman who were addressed. The Good Friday observances of Christians are a continuation of Yom Kippur, On the Day of Atonement there was to be no work, and the appointed sacrifices were to be made. Most important, as Grant noted, Atonement brings the glory back, but man must be made to know his need and to receive it humbly. The practices of this day had a characteristic of which Hebrews has much to say. In Israel, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, Sin is a separating power. With Christ, the veil of separation is gone, and man has in him direct access to the Father. Hebrews 6, 19, 9, 3 following, 10, 20. In Judaism, the emphasis of Yom Kippur is on the collective confession of sins, rather than on the objective fact of God's provided atonement. Pietism has tended to a like error those who failed to observe the day were, according to this law, to be excommunicated, verse 29, and God would bring destruction on their own way on violators, verse 30. The atonement gives life. To reject the atonement is to choose death. It is noteworthy that the Hebrew day was from evening to evening. In some churches, the liturgical calendar requires observances in terms of this fact so that various holy days begin on the evening preceding the modern dates. We have again a holy day which stresses the meaning of time. Modern Judaism, in commenting on Yom Kippur, sees it in terms of man's self-atonement. Since the sacrificial system was not continued after the destruction of the temple in the Jewish-Roman War, AD 66-70, a humanistic view of salvation openly took over Thus, one writer has said of Yom Kippur that it adds a new dimension. However low man has fallen, he can pull himself up again. Since perhaps the 8th century, the 
called Nidre has become a part of the service and it has led to anti-Jewish charges that all oaths are annulled on Yom Kippur. In actual fact, called Nedrei applies only to personal religious vows which neither affect nor involve others. In modernist churches, atonement has given way also to man's self-salvation and the social gospel holds to salvation by the state. All such interpretations see the meaning of time as devoted from time, from man. As in the fall, Genesis 3, 1-5, man becomes his own saviour. Time, however, when separated from God, loses its meaning and becomes merely an empty succession of moments. Existentialism is a logical consequence. It exalts the meaningless moment and sees salvation in an existence which is uninfluenced by anything outside or beyond itself. No atonement is then either desired or seen as necessary. The exaltation of time leads to the destruction of its meaning. Since God is the creator of all things, the world, time and history, the atonement and redemption of man, time and history is impossible apart from him because the atonement alone gives life. To reject it is to choose death. The atonement also tells us that progress is possible in history. Humanistic doctrines of progress have foundered and are being abandoned. Many aphorisms call attention to this. History repeats itself, we are told, meaning that it does not advance. Sir Robert Walpole said, Anything but history... For history must be false. Others have seen history as a lie because it posits a meaning and direction. The Bible is clear that the universe is one of total meaning. God created and God ordained meaning so that the very hairs of our head are all numbered. Matthew 10.30, Luke 12.7 Without the atonement, the world is meaningless. It is caught in the cycle of sin and death, whereas for us there is atonement and resurrection. Grant is right. Atonement brings the glory back. The glory of God's creation of all things as very good. Genesis 1, 31-32